Hi, my name is Cecilia Puna, and welcome to this episode of Brave New Women. All around the world, there are amazing, ordinary women doing extraordinary things. Brave New Women is about giving those women a platform and a voice, and it's about changing the way that women are perceived. And it's a way of inspiring all of us to do the things that we've always wanted to do. Today, I'm sitting down to talk to Dr. Cindy Pan. And when I first met Cindy, she was 11 and I was 12. And she was slim and shy and top of the class. And she had two long black plaits down her back. And she was also a fabulous dancer. And since then, she's come a very long way. She studied medicine. She became a general practitioner. But she's also become a very well-known figure in Australian public life. She appears regularly on television. She's a newspaper columnist on relationships, health and sex, and she's written three books, which are Pandora's Box, Lifting the Lid on Life's Little Nasties, Head Starts, 100 Tips for Raising Clever, Confident, Creative Kids, and the third book is called Playing Hard to Get. She's also been the ambassador for Chinese New Year for the City of Sydney from 2002 to 2013. So, and she has done many, many things um, in addition to that. So, welcome, Cindy. Hi, Cecilia. Lovely to see you. (laughs) Cindy, when you left school, you I know I know that you wanted to be a a dancer. And so, why did you do medicine? So, really, I wanted to be a dancer when I was in, say, um, I probably really wanted to leave school and be a dancer in year nine, year 10. By the time I finished year 12, I I had sort of already sort of changed course in a way. But um, the time when I most wanted to become a ballerina um, was probably, yeah, when I was like 13, 14, and I wanted to leave school after either year nine or at least by year 10 um, and do ballet full time to just give it a real good crack and, you know, see what was possible. But, um, yeah, my parents had other ideas, so I I stayed at school. I still did ballet, as you know, but um, uh, I obviously, yeah, I still stayed at school. And, um, yeah, so by the time I finished um, year 12, uh, I think I was already thinking about doing other things. Um, but I, I, I never stopped um loving ballet and dance and I I still love it just as much as ever and I probably dance more now (laughs) than I did then um yeah so Mm. yeah but um you know I I I always have loved dancing and I still really love it and what about what about medicine do you do you love being a doctor are you pleased that that's something that you've done by time um I, I felt as if by time I was like 16, it sounds a bit strange to say, but I, I felt like by the time I was 16, like I was um, like that ship had passed a little bit. I, I feel as if that to really give it my best shot, I needed to do full time when I was sort of 14, 15, um, and like to become the best dancer I could be. Because I think, you know, obviously it's really hard to be a professional ballerina. And I don't think I was so much fixated on becoming a ballerina as to see to see how 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 good I could get uh, and see if I could become a professional ballerina. And I felt as if the the only way to to do that would be, you know, to really take off at that time when you really need to do full time. I think I felt like um, it was a bit late by the time I finished work to see and do what I really wanted to do with France. Um so then so then I thought I think you know I'll I'll go uni and then out of the things that there were to choose out of uni I was the most interested in medicine and because by then you know my brother was already in in medicine at, at Sydney Uni like he was only one year ahead. Hello Rafi <laughs> um, well and also, I suppose, you know, like my mum being a theatre sister, it was something that I kind of felt some familiarity with uh, and I was interested. 
um, I think that at that age, I didn't really know much about anything. Um, I don't even know that doing medicine really prepared me for what it's actually like to be a doctor because it's pretty different, you know, learning stuff like, and then actually doing stuff because, I mean, I don't know if it's the same with law, but, I mean, a lot of the stuff we learnt, or most of the stuff we learnt, you don't necessarily use a lot of it day to day. Um, I mean, day to day you're kind of dealing with people and I'm not sure that they told us anything about that. They told us a bit about that, but probably, yeah, the, the actual reality of what it's like to be a doctor in hospital or a doctor in general practice um, I think I actually discovered that I enjoyed general practice when I first did general practice, which was actually when I was doing the King and I tour. So um, I think, I mean, you know, as you know, like after I did my internship, I played um, the minor lead in Children of the Dragon, which was that ABC, BBC miniseries. And while I was filming that BBC miniseries, which was from about January to May, of uh, 1991 because I did my internship in 1990. Um, because uh, I was doing the filming, I couldn't work for, for full-time at hospital. So I was only doing sort of part-time on the weekends. I was doing emergency at um, Sydney Hospital on Saturdays and uh, Prince Alfred Hospital on Sundays. So during the week, I had a lot of free time when I wasn't filming and so I'd do class at Bowdoin Visa. And one day when I was at Bowdoin Visa, there was like a, a sign up saying auditions for The King and I at the Seymour Centre. So I thought, oh, this will be really exciting because I had seen that movie, A Chorus Line. And I'd always thought, oh, that's really exciting, you know, having to go to an audition and having a number and, you know, getting eliminated. And I just thought, I want to go. So just to have the experience of being as if I'm in a chorus line, not thinking that I would necessarily get picked, but I just wanted to you know, have that experience. And, well, strangely, I mean, it really was a bit like that in the sense that we really did have numbers and everything, and they did at the end of each session basically do a cut, like they'd say, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so, number, this, that, and other, please stay, everyone else, thank you very much and all that. And, and I still remember, like, the first day it was all dancing and then, like, the, basically the ones who made it through, we were asked to come the next day to sing a song. And do you remember Madame Romensky? Did you ever go and have no. a No. So she was my singing teacher at that time. I still remember it was, um, you know, Monday night because I'm pretty sure that the first audition was on Monday. I remember I rang her and said, oh, you know, Madame Romensky, tomorrow I've got to do this singing audition. Do you think I should come and have a listen? <laughs> yeah. Cindy, I really think I'm not sure what I can teach you tonight. She said, I think you'd be better off getting an early night. <laughs> Very good advice. Um, you remember that time I was living in Glee? I was living on Toxeth Road opposite your parents. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. she was, and I think at that time I did have a car at that time because I remember I pretty much had it parked just, you know, you know that T junction there? I yeah, think I had yeah, like, yeah all the time I didn't but I didn't really use it that much because you know I was working at Sydney Hospital and Prince Alfred where um oh actually I did park I just you remember I also I had Paulina you remember the the um the, the toy poodle I had that I named after Dr Turner yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she actually came and visited me at, at Toxic Road and she met Paulina yeah anyway um for anyone watching that's our French teacher <laughs> Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, so I had to go the next day and, um, yeah, I remember I sang a song from West Side Story and then I remember, this is back in the days of um, answering machines, I remember I got this message on my answering machine basically saying, you know, that, that I'd been chosen, that the tour was going to, that the rehearsal was going to start on this date and the, then the tour was going to be, you know, for 10 months or whatever. And I still remember my first reaction was, Oh my God, what kind of a tin pot production is this? <laughs> and then, of course, I found out, you know, Hayley Mills was coming out from England to play Mrs. Anna, and it was actually, you know, a, a really going to be a really good production. Which part were you playing? I was Angel George. So, 
Well, actually, originally I was just cast to be on ensemble, but it was just like, you know, um, you know, like all those stories that you see. The, the funny thing about it was it was just an amazing coincidence that the first day of rehearsals fell like two days before the last day of shooting on the mini series. So it basically dovetailed like that. So I had to miss either the I, definitely at least one day. It could have been the first two days of rehearsals. I remember the, the rehearsals for King and I were at Dynamite Studio. Do you remember David Atkins and Cherie DaCosta? They had a dance school in Surrey Hills there um, called Dynamite because you remember they had the show Dancing Dancing Man, Dancing Dynamite, Dynamite. Like, anyway, this is called Dynamite Studios. Um, so all I know is I missed the first day of rehearsal and possibly the second day as well. But I wasn't too worried about it. And th- like they knew, my agent told them, look, she can't come. She's finishing off filming on this mini series. And they were like, well, what are they going to do about it? Um, but you know, it's funny in a way, because if, if it had overlapped like a month, then, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it. It was just like coincidence. Mm-hmm. Um, so I still remember like I went up to the first rehearsal and it, a lot of people already obviously knew some of the choreography. And, um, well, I remember I was like just sitting or standing at the back, like waiting for something. And I, and basically the girl who was playing, who was one of the principal dancers playing the Angel George role, all I remember she, she seemed to jump in the air. And then all I know is she was on the ground. And, and then like they came with a stretcher and basically she got taken away. She, she never came back. And I was like, dude, what, what happened? Like I, I only just turned up and was just trying to acclimatize myself to like, all these new people who, like, they'd known each other for two days, you know what I mean? I just walked in. And basically um, they, they they came to me and said, oh, we want you to play this part, which I thought, oh, <laughs> like, I remember I had to, uh, they said, okay, this is actually a principal role, so you actually, you'll get a raise. Like, <laughs> and I remember, like, like, it was pretty much my first day there, and I remember I rang my agent and I said, well, guess what? Apparently I'm getting a right. So I said, what have you done? I said, well, this girl, like, she she, she hurt herself and they, they took it away. <laughs> well, it's good because, like, it meant that all the things that I'd missed, well, I didn't need to learn that anymore anyway. And it was probably just as well because of a lot of it. I remember thinking, oh, like, that's going to be that. And also some of the bits they had to wear, like, a full head mask for some of it. And I remember thinking, oh, it's going to be really claustrophobic. Um, <laughs> And, yeah, so that's what happened. And it was like, do you know what I mean? It all happened. And I still remember um, the choreographer said so they had this lady called, um, uh, what's her name, y- Yuki, or she was the original, um, she played the original um, Eliza in the Jerome Robbins um, choreograph, you know, like the Broadway thing. And she was also in the movie with, you know, like Gil Brenner. And so she came out as the choreographer to teach us the choreography, the person who, who it had been choreographed on, and her daughter, Susan Kikuchi, who had then also played it on Broadway, she was kind of the assistant to teach us. And I still remember Susan coming to me and saying something like, um, you know, <laughs> you're not necessarily the best dancer, but you're the best actor for this part. And Tell me about, you know, like you, you have the best face for it, like because you, know, you have to sort of have certain facial expressions or whatever. And, um, yeah, but she said, oh, you know, <laughs> have to work on you. And, well, yeah, that, that's what happened. It was it was quite, you know, like I was just like sitting there minding my own business and I'm like, this happened. And then the next thing I know, basically, yeah, I've got – <laughs> promotion. Yeah, so I played um, Angel George in the ballet, and then for the rest of it, we were all like all the all of us um, dancers. We were wives and wives of the king and and mothers of, of all the kids. And then they actually choreographed these extra ballets that weren't in the original Broadway production. That weren't choreographed by Jer- Jerome Robbins. That were choreographed by Yuriko. That's right. Her name was Yuriko, and the daughter her daughter was Susan Capucci. Hmm. And um, so that was a that was a uh, that sounds like it was a pretty important um, part of your life getting into uh, you know principal well, part of your thing of I I still remember very distinctly trying to decide whether to, whether to do it um, and I remember um, my agent at that time Jane Cameron at Cameron's 
she said something like, um, in life when you have the choice between, um, you know, two good choices, then um, choose the thing that most excites you or something like that. And I remember I actually went and chatted to your dad, Mr. Stewart. I always called him Mr. Stewart. He's <laughs> 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 like, you know, for a while there, your dad, you know how he used to go to the Hyde Park Club in, you know, Park Street on the corner there? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. While I was living in Park Street, you know, the Park Regis, I used to go there as well. And I remember, like, everyone else called him Russell because that was his name, but I always called him Mr. Stewart because he was your dad. And I remember after a while, one of my friends started calling him Mr. Russell. <laughs> <laughs> they all knew him as Russell and they'd always, always only known him as Russell. But then because I was calling him Mr. Stewart, they're like, Mr. Russell. <laughs> <laughs> I went to talk to your dad and he just said, look, I don't think it matters. Like I think if you do it, it it's, it's probably going to be really good. If you don't do it, if you know, you go back to hospital and, and so forth and, um, you know, when see what else happens, like in terms of acting and things. He said, I think that'll work out well as well. And, yeah, and, and I just sort of thought, well, you know, it gave me the courage to think, well, why not? I, I know at the time, you know, my mum had a tendency to be quite overprotective um, and cautious. She was like, no, 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 don't do it. Um, you know, it's a terrible idea. Um, and... But, I mean, the thing about my mum is that was sort of the pattern with her. She'd always be, like, very cautious. Oh, no, no, don't do it, don't do it. But then once you do it, she'd be, like, the absolute biggest fan of it. Like, so she would come, like, to each stage, she'd come and she'd watch the show. And she had this thing, like, you know how my mum was really short. But she would always, um, well, she would, she would always obviously get um, free tickets. She'd get a house seat. So she had really good seats right in the front. As soon as, um, as soon as she could, she said she would try and kick off a standing ovation. <laughs> she would try and, like, stand up as quickly as she could because, you know, how with a standing ovation, like, you, you can be thinking, you'd think, oh, no one else is standing up. Whereas as soon as someone stands up, if, if you even thought it was pretty okay, then, then you stand up as well. So she, she used to do that. And it's funny, actually, because I caught up with one of my friends that I did the tour with actually last Sunday, and she was – you know, speaking, you know, really warmly about mum and say, you know, how much she loved her. And I mean, my mum was, you know, very warm. Like she she just, she loved the show. Like, you know, she had like, she had the King and I apron, she had the King and I sweatshirt and, you know, the King and I mug. Like she was like a, like she just was, she absolutely loved it. So, yeah, I think that was, I think I can be a bit like that too, like with, with my kids. Like I know like say when Anton first was interested in cadets I was like cadets like isn't that just polishing boots and using brass so like I, I didn't really see the point of it but now like I think it's really good um and yeah say so, well I mean I, I guess you know I, I wouldn't say I was necessarily negative about things but certainly things that my kids get into like I really kind of get into too like say when Jeremy started basketball I don't know anything about basketball um but now like I really love basketball and like Jeremy and I, we were even referees for a while. Like, you know, I, I, I um, I, I think mum was, um, yeah, mum was always really enthusiastic once, like once she could see that this was what, what you were doing. And yeah, she, she'd always get on board. And yeah, it was really good. Yeah. So what, what happened about your, um, you know, the King and I, and, and what okay, happened so about your yeah. medical, what happened about your medical career? While you were yeah, well, that. that was the original question. It was like, you know, liking medicine. Well, I, I think what happened was that so we started doing this tour. So I went from being a, a medical student to being an intern, which, as you know, like it's, a, it's a full-time thing, um, to basically being a showgirl. And so we did eight shows a week. We did um, every night, Monday to Saturday, and then matinees on Wednesday and Saturday. So as you can imagine, you've actually got quite a lot of free time during the day. Like at the beginning, of course, you're rehearsing, you're learning the show. But after you've done the show, you know, a hell of a lot of times, you really do know the show and you've got all this free time. So to begin with, I was like, you know, reading. I think, you know, when we were in Perth, I was even taking golf lessons, tennis lessons. Like, do you know what I mean? Like I had never had this experience of having basically the whole day to myself. Like I think at the beginning of the tour, 
the, the way, for some reason, our producers had this arrangement that in every every city that we went to, we had free entry to nightclubs. So, you know, we would, like, finish the show and, of course, you know, you're kind of excited, you don't want to go straight home to bed, so we'd all go out clubbing and things like that. But as you know, I don't drink. <laughs> and, like, after a while, I mean, like, you know, I, I wasn't as into doing that and because, like, the pattern was that basically you'd stay up really late and then you'd sleep in the next day. So do you know what I mean? But after a while I sort of thought, oh, you know, I'm not sure about this and kind of wanted to do something else. And so it was my mum who actually suggested, um, well, why don't you try doing some locums? This was when we were back in Sydney for a bit during, during the tour. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I couldn't do that. I mean, like, what if, what if someone comes in and has a cardiac arrest? And mum was like, well, if someone has a cardiac arrest, call triple O like anyone else would. <laughs> <laughs> but she said, you know, mostly in general practice, that's not what happens. And it's funny, I often think about what she said because, like, say, you know how we have to regularly redo our CPR and basic life support type of course? And I did this quite recently. And so we're all you know, practising, you know, what do you do in a cardiac arrest? But the fact is, you know, you know, I, I I guess I've been in medicine now since, well, 1989, 1990. I've never actually had a situation where I have had to manage a cardiac arrest in general practice. Like when I was um, uh, in hospital, like I was part of the cardiac arrest team at one point, which means that, you know, you carry an extra pager. So there's cardiac arrest, you get paged and you've just got to run to whatever that ward is. But generally speaking, it's obviously not just you that's managing it. Like I think there was one time where I got there first, but but you're never like doing it all by yourself. So, um, and, yeah, I was sort of, I, I often think, yeah, my mum was right. Like mostly that doesn't happen. In fact, to date it still hasn't happened, you know, <laughs> touch wood. Like it, it still hasn't actually happened. And my mum was like, you know, like, you know, why don't you try it? And, um, yeah, I don't know why. Like she must have convinced me, and so so I did, and that was my first place of general practice. And I and I remember, um, you know, so basically I I do like a general practice locum in the day, and, and finish in time to be able to get in, get to the theatre with plenty of time to do the show. Obviously, I didn't do it on Wednesdays and Saturdays because that's when we had matinees. But that's actually how I started general practice, which is. Um, kind of weird really like a lot of the things that happened definitely weren't planned like you couldn't plan it like there's no way I could have planned you know doing the miniseries like it just happened that but did you have a you had an agent when yes what happened was I didn't ever fancy myself as oh here I am an actress because like why would I think that (laughs) do you know what I mean like um like what happened was when I was at uni I had a modeling agent Cameron's and what happened was when they were trying to find someone for that miniseries, Children of the Dragon, apparently they approached my modelling agency and they went, oh, well, Cindy, you go, see, you know, see how you go. They gave me a script and I sort of learnt it and had a go and then I got called back and called back and then next thing I knew, well, you know, I had this part. And so, you know what I mean, it wasn't something I set out to do. And it wasn't like I'd ever said, oh, and by the way, I'm an actress, because why would I say that? Like, if anything, I might have said I'm a dancer, but even then, you know, by then, you know, I was pretty much like, you know, I'd just done my internship, so, or I was doing my internship. Like, I don't think I was going around going, well, oh, by the way, I'm a dancer. Like, I had done a lot of dancing, and I loved dancing, but I didn't go around saying I'm a dancer, and I certainly wouldn't have said I'm an actor, because... Well, what acting have I done? <laughs> <laughs> you remember that movie, The Knights Belong to the Novelist? So I suppose we kind of acted in that, but really we were just dancing and we were really sort of like, yeah, just scenery really, but we were really mm. dancing. I wouldn't have said I acted in that. I, mm. I wouldn't have said that I'd ever done any acting, but I was certainly willing to give it a go. And I think, I'm just trying to think, at that time, I think I had done classes at the Acting Centre. Um, yeah, so I suppose, yeah, as interns go, I was doing like a lot of like things that like, like I, was, I was doing singing lessons and I was doing like a lot of dancing. 
And yeah, I did used to do class at the Acton Centre. So I suppose. I wonder if your yeah. dancing, if your dancing also was um, uh, in dancing, you were actually learning to act without yeah, knowing maybe. it. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. But, but I mean, it was just one of those things where they were like, you know, do you want to do this? And I'm like, all right. And well, here's the script. And like, all right. Yeah, I can read. I can do this. And I, the scene was like quite an emotional scene. So I thought, well, looks like she's quite emotional. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it was just, it was lucky. I think maybe if I hadn't gotten that first role, um, maybe I, maybe they wouldn't have asked me to do any other things. Um, and then, and then I said, because it was because I got that role and it started at the beginning of 91, the, the ABC BBC miniseries. So it just meant that I didn't put in preferences for my residency at the hospital because I knew, well, I can't because, you know, I'm doing this job. But I guess it was lucky in a way that I, like, I just went directly from my internship into this role. And then because I was doing that role, because I was, you know, living in Glebe there and I was able to go to Bowdoin Beach, it was just down the road, um, because I went to Bowdoin Beach on a day when there happened to be that notice and I saw it and I thought, oh, Seymour sent it, like, just, just across the road and... I don't think I actually thought, oh, I want to be in this musical. I don't think I was thinking that far ahead. I was just really thinking of that movie, A Chorus Line, and thinking, oh, this will be just like <laughs> movie. Do you know what I mean? Like I just really liked the idea of having that experience because I just loved that movie. Um, and, yeah, to be honest, like it did feel like I was in that movie. You know, not exactly. Like I didn't obviously stand there and give a monologue and all that, but that whole thing of, just that excitement of, you know, getting, you know, gradually cut and whittled down and just going, well, I'm still here. Um, and then, you know, the whole thing of, you know, getting called back, like it was just an exciting experience that, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't expect to have. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Have you ever done anything like that since then? Um, well, I've done a lot of castings, yeah. Um, and then I think... You know, like like my son, like like Anton, Jeremy less so, but Anton definitely. Like I really do think he loves musicals and shows generally. Like I've always loved them as well. And not that I necessarily saw that many, but I one recollection I have is often, you know, after seeing a show when you walk walk away, you know, seeing that stage door. You know, seeing that door that says stage door and you go, oh, that's where they go in and that's where they come out. And I knew that um, because you remember when I went to Paris, you know, on that trip that I went, um, I still remember like meeting Rudolf Nuria the first time. It was like standing at the stage door and just knowing, well, that's where they come out. So if they haven't already come out, if you stand here long enough, they're going to come out. So I always had a sort of a, a sense of magic around that stage door and the idea of wouldn't it be magical to just go in there and see what it's like you know, inside that magic box, especially like after you've seen the show and you're so full of wonder and awe and, you know, just so full of that magic and you just think, oh, it's, it's all back there. So I think that, you know, the idea of being in the musical, it was that sense that, you know, you'd be able to, well, you'd be going in, like every day you're turning up and work, you're going through the stage door and like being inside that um, that kind of magic magic box. So I think, yeah, I thought, yeah, that would be very exciting. Um, but, but as I said, you know, after a while when you've done the show that many times, like you go, okay, what else? And so, yeah, that's when mum suggested, you know, why don't you try a general practice locum? And I actually really, really enjoyed it. So that's when I actually discovered what it was like to be a doctor, more so than doing medicine. Because doing medicine, I don't really, I really don't feel as if I had a real sense of the day to day. I don't know what it actually is like to be a doctor. Do you know what I mean? Because watching other doctors, um, and also being an intern, isn't really the same in a way. Do you know what I mean? Like when you're part. What did of you What did you enjoy about general practice? I guess talking to people and um, like one of the places where I worked like in my early years was in Oxford Street. This was um, 
like after after I came back from the tour. I, 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 when I came back from the tour, the first place, one of the first places I worked was in the Women's Medical Centre in Macquarie Street, which in a way was a, like a complete contrast to working essentially a stone's throw away at Oxford Square. So Women's Medical Centre was on Macquarie Street, just down from Martin Place. And, well, as the name suggests, it was all women. And um, I guess by and large, you know, like people that you would imagine would be attending a practice in Macquarie Street. And so for yeah. people who are listening from overseas, Macquarie Street is the, right in the centre of the central business district of Sydney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, lawyers, not, not all lawyers and judges and things, but people who are, I guess, relatively more conservative. And it was a, a private billing practice. So, you know, I mean, it was, it was um, a certain type of people, relatively conservative, um, and, well, all women. Whereas um, then I, I started work, I was actually working at the two places at the same time, um, but I started working in this um, practice in Oxford Square, which is, um, you know, well, for people who don't know, that's like it's on the other side of Hyde Park, but by then it's called Darling Hips, and it's um, a, a very different kind of milieu socially, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose Oxford, Oxford Street, you would have to say, is probably the gay, the centre of uh, the gay Sydney. And um, yeah. there's also a lot of um, it's getting very close to King's Cross, which is the, the red light district. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, put it this way, at Macquarie Street, at you know, up on the, I don't know, like the ninth floor or whatever it is in the Women's Medical Centre, you're not seeing people who are covered in piercings, tattoos, who are IV drug users, who are alcoholics, who are homeless, who are sex workers. You know what I mean? Like it's it's very different. And, and obviously, yet yeah, nowhere near the number of, well, no gay men at all, of course, at the Women's Medical Centre. You didn't have any men. Whereas, you know, at Oxford Square, um, well, we had people from all walks of life. We also had a lot of people who were kind of travellers because there were a lot of, like, um, I don't know, hotels and, um, you know, the, the YMCA was not far from there. So we had a real um, mixture of people, which I, I would say I really enjoyed. And having come out of um, The King and I, where so I went from, you know, obviously where we, we went, which was all girls, and it seemed like, like quite a straight environment. Like I don't think we, like we didn't have a lot of knowledge about, um, well, anything other than just this very sort of, um, um, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but like, yeah, very, very safe, conservative environment. Very conservative. We, we didn't really, learn much about other walks of life or anything and and I went through all of um uni and um hospital not knowing any out gay people like I mean in, in retrospect obviously there were heaps of people that were gay but they weren't necessarily out and I would have said oh no I don't actually know any gay people I know there are gay people but I don't know any to the king and I where well let's say well most of the guys were gay and I just learned a lot about um well um different <laughs> different I guess cultures and, and things and so then I really enjoyed being in Oxford Square um and having you know like patients who are gay and bi and you know try sexual try anything and um I, I just really enjoyed seeing this other side of life that I hadn't really known anything about when, you know, we were living in up in North Shore and going to Sydney Uni and even in hospital I didn't, I was, I think, quite, um, you know, sheltered or I just didn't know a lot of stuff. And then I think I came out of the experience of like a 10-month tour with a much more, I guess, cosmopolitan and uh, just a, a different group of people. Um, Cindy, when did you start the writing, so writing for the newspapers and writing the books? Tell me about that. Okay. I mean, it was actually during the King and I tour when I had so much time to read just for fun that I first got the idea, oh, wouldn't it be great to be a writer? But what ended up happening was um, so I did um, this, you you remember I did Sex Life, this um, series where I was the medical presenter? 
I did a few series of that. And after that, there was this TV show uh, called The Panel. It was um, it was a national show on Channel 10 um, and it was basically a panel-style show. It was the first kind of panel-style show in Australia. It was made by a working dog. And because I did that show, um, I kind of got um, – it sort of raised my profile, I suppose. How did so you get on the show? How did you get on the show? Through your agent? Oh. No, they just ran and asked me. I just – like the same way I got, I, I did Sex Life. It's basically this guy basically rang one day. He was the executive producer at Beyond, and said, "You know, we're looking for a medical presenter for this show." And he said, "And all roads lead to you," or something like that. It sounds like he'd been asking around, and people had said, "Oh well, you know, she's a doctor and she's done acting. Maybe she can do it." So I, I had to do like um, a, a test shoot type of thing, and and I did it, and they said, "Yep, we want you to do this." Um, and then because I'd done that, like, so the people at the panel, I gather, that, that's how they obviously knew of me. And so they asked me to do their show and I ended up doing that about six or seven times. But I know after the very first time I appeared on the panel, I got a call from this um, editor at the Sun Herald. So the Sun Herald used to have this um, kind of uh, lifestyle lift out called Sun Herald Tempo. And she said, you know, we want you to write a column. And I was like, all right, what, what do you want me to write about? And she said, oh, you know, you can write about whatever you like. She said, we'll give it the title Life and Love. She said, you, know, you can really write about anything. And I said, oh, all right. <laughs> and, um, and the topic I chose for the first um, uh, piece was honesty. Is that, is that really what you want to hear? And, um, and, yeah, I remember like this was, so this was, what year would that be? All I know is I did not have a computer. It was written, handwritten, you know, my handwriting, <laughs> and then faxed through. Mm-hmm. And then the, this, most of my early writing jobs was in this um, fashion that people would now just think was absolutely crazy and so primitive. I remember like I would handwrite it and then fax it and then if they couldn't read it then they'd ring me and I'd just read it over the phone to them like it's sort of like the idea of doing that now we would go are you mad that's just so mad like it was not typed I, I didn't have a typewriter I didn't know how to type I just handwrote <laughs> my essay at school fed it through the fax machine and I still remember every time I'd do a fax I'd be like now, which way up is it? Which way up is it? Like, you know, so primitive. And um, I still remember when she got the first article, she said, oh, so you really can write. And then that's how I got my column. And I still remember, like, back then it was a dollar a word and that was a really good rate. In fact, you won't get that rate now. <laughs> In fact, now, as you probably know, like, they don't want to they don't want to pay you they, because everyone out there is blogging and writing and they all want to go, oh, well, won't this be great for your profile? And it's like, oh, <laughs> I'm not really looking at that. Um, but, you know, back then um, it was so exciting and I, I really I really loved it. I remember. So these opportunities were, were just coming to you without because you, well, because yeah, you had a profile. Yeah, people would just ring the practice. And, you know, I still remember when they were like, oh, all right, there's a guy called Tim Klukas. He's And I answered the phone, okay, hello, I'm an executive producer from Beyond. And we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, oh, you know, can we do a test shoot? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, and, yeah, and the same with the column. She just rang and said, you know, do you want to do this? And, I mean, presumably if I'd written something and she thought, no, this is a dog's breakfast, she might have gone, oh, I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. All I know is that, like, it went well. She later left and a lady called Christine Hogan took over as as the editor. And all I know is that um, basically the way I ended up um, doing Pandora's Box was that um, apparently the people at, well, there was a particular commissioning editor at HarperCollins, um, this lady, this really, really lovely lady called Alison Urquhart, and apparently she really liked my column. She said that she used it because this is like it's so funny now to say this because it just sounds so prehistoric. But she said that she would love these articles and she would ring up her friends and read 
it, like leave messages on their answering machines of just reading segments of my articles and they just kill themselves laughing. <laughs> and um, so I still remember like I had to have a meeting with her about, you know, what this book was all about. And I really literally did say something along the lines of, well, I want it to be kind of all out of order and not make any sense. <laughs> like I, I, I wasn't really able to explain myself very well. And I remember she was like, yes, that sounds fantastic. And I remember thinking, wow, this is going to work out because what I've just said really <laughs> is not selling the idea at all. So I said, oh, I want it to be all hotchy potchy and all out of order and not make any sense. And she's going, that sounds great. <laughs> and I thought, um, like you know, I, mean, I think this is going to work out. Like if you think that sounds good, like you, you obviously understand what I mean, even though I haven't really explained it well. And so the other thing that happened was, say, when you write um, a column for a newspaper, the word limit is is quite strict. Like it's either a thousand words, it's eight hundred words, or whatever it is. And often when you write it, if it's over, you have to then meticulously go back and trim, trim, trim to try and get it in the word count. Otherwise, it's very annoying for them. But more importantly, if they edit it for you, they might take out the bits that you thought were the most funny or the, were the best bits. So, you know, it's it's kind of best if you edit it yourself and send it to them kind of ready to roll. But so, of course, like I would, but I would keep the long version and then I'd send in the cut down version, the thousand word or the 800 word one. So the good thing about with the book, because I still remember like Alison said, you know, we want it to be a real chunk. We want it to be like about 80,000 words. She said, so she said, you know, all the long versions, give us all the long versions. So, so it was kind of good because like all the original long versions of all the articles that ended up being in Sun Herald were in the book. But then of course I had to like write a hell of a lot more as well. And she said, you know, because this is a book, not, you know, a Sunday paper that, you know, the whole family's sitting there reading, she said you can be a lot more kind of out there, a bit more edgy. But don't forget, you know, this was, um, so Pandora's Box I think was published in, was it 2000? <clears throat> yeah, 2000 or 2001, I can't remember. But, you know, obviously what was considered edgy then is different to what's considered edgy now. It's like 20 years later. But, um, uh yeah, no, at the time I, I used to really love writing those articles and, like, I kind of, I knew every word. So when the paper would come out, and, again, you know, there was no online, I mean, as you know, so you, you just basically go to the newsagent, get the newspaper, and, like, I, I'd be in the newsagent, like, reading it, you know, checking that they hadn't moved a, a single, you know, comma or anything, which generally they hadn't because because I, I was a lot more meticulous about it back then. And... um yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I, I remember then, you know, I had a deadline for the manuscript for Pandora's Box. And, well, I don't know if you remember me, me being this way, but I, I certainly by then I was a bit of a procrastinator. And I remember, like, as it was getting closer, I'm thinking, shit, I'm not anywhere near finish this. And I remember I, I rang and I said, oh, Alison, you know that deadline? Like, <clears throat> like how, how firm is that? She said, no, no, it's not firm at all. You can have at least another few weeks. And I'm thinking, a few weeks, that's not, like, that's that's not going to be enough at all. So now I remember thinking, I've really got to get down and, and do this. Like, there's no point, like, it's one thing to say, oh, I haven't finished. There's another thing to say, you know, I've got, like, 30,000 words. Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm not even really close. So then I remember, um, like, obviously I was still, you know, working in general practice. But I remember, like, I I, um, I stopped counting words. Like, at the beginning when I was trying to count words and it was kind of hard, but then I would just forget about the word count, just start writing, and then it kind of, um, yeah, it, it, it sort of seemed to flow and, and yeah, and then, then it, it was done and, yeah, it was very, very exciting. It mm. was um, a little bit like, you know, like your first child, but made out of paper (laughs) (laughs) but what are you what are you what are you working on at the moment what what does your life look like at the moment so what my life looks like at the moment is like I've got you know a 15 year old and 17 year old so probably they are my main focus but at the same time like there's only so much you can do like they're their own people they have to kind of do it themselves but they probably that's probably what I kind of think about or maybe say worry about the most um, 
I'm actually dancing more now than than I probably ever have. Like I actually do class pretty much every day now. So um, yeah, so um, I I might have to take Jeremy to like sometimes I'll go to school twice in the morning because Jeremy almost always has either some sort of band or orchestra or um, sport kind of training. I always call it basketball rehearsal. <laughs> When's your basketball rehearsal? <laughs> Is your annoying. Um, and then, um, and then I'll often then take Anton to school, or I'll then go to ballet. So I go to um, the wharf and do ballet class pretty much every morning. And then I go to work. So I go to work at general practice. And then, um, depending on which day, like say on Mondays, I usually have orchestra um, rehearsal. So um, I'm now playing cello. I've upsized from the violin, <laughs> and. Um, and Tuesdays, usually after work, um, Jeremy has a basketball game, so I go and um, either watch or bench for that. And then, yeah, so, like, I, I either pick Jeremy up from school. Anton doesn't usually need to be picked up from school from the point of view that he stays after school. Um, like, mostly, well, often he, he stays and does his work at school. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm not really specifically working on anything I think I'm just um kind of enjoying myself a little Mm. bit um and yeah just not really doing anything particular (laughs) Um, is there anything I mean what 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 strikes me is that um nothing really seems to scare you I mean does has anything scared you over the years lots of things yeah, no, lots of things. But, I mean, I saw this really good meme the other day, which was sort of a, about sort of like, oh, you know, like you might be scared about something and then you go, oh, actually, maybe that won't happen. But then you think of something even worse that might happen. And then there's something, there's something along the lines of, oh, you know, I can always think of something that scares me. But then if you reframe it, you say, I have a powerful imagination. Like, so... You know, so I suppose, yeah, that's a really good way of reframing all the things that you're scared about, go to say, oh, well, I have a powerful imagination. Well, I certainly do, and I can imagine lots and lots of terrible things, but I suppose I can also imagine lots of good things. And, um, I mean, maybe ballet is good for that because certainly for the period of time that you're dancing, you're generally not worrying about things too much. And, well, it is all kind of like a bit of a, a dream isn't it like it's um like like especially now like I really am just dancing because I love it and I don't love it any less in fact I think I love it more and every so often I actually feel like I'm improving um and well I don't know I, I just really enjoy it and um I feel like I have to dance now because When else am I going to dance? And I remember, well, you know our friend Mrs Callaghan? I remember, you know, near the end of her life she said, you know, just dance as much as you can. And I remember thinking, well, I mean, at that time, you know, the kids were a lot younger, so it wasn't as easy to to take that advice. And, yeah, I didn't have as much, I guess, freedom to just do what I want to do. But um, I remember thinking, yeah, yeah, that's really important because, like if it's some like given that dancing is some sort of like this um, sort of sustained love that I've had, this passion I've had my whole life. Like um, there's been lots of times when I haven't had time to dance or I haven't been able to, but I've I've always wanted to, and now um, I can. And it's sort of like it's this sort of goes back to your original question. You know why why didn't you? you know, leave and do ballet. Well, I guess I didn't leave school and do ballet, but I have danced my whole life every time I could. Like even when I was pregnant, it's funny, like the tap teacher I have now, Tracy, when I came back to her class, which was I think it must have been two years ago, she was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, you're here. The last time I saw you, you were pregnant. And so I thought, wow, that, that I think that was when I was pregnant with Jeremy. And so I think, oh, yeah, that's true. Like when I was pregnant and when the kids were little, I rarely did class, but I, I still did occasionally and, and I always wanted to. And now I feel like, well, 
this is my time to dance. And um, like this, I, I just, I don't enjoy it any less. I, I think I enjoy it more. Because I think when you're young, you're judging yourself more and you're like, oh, I have to be better. And um, everything that you can do, you kind of take for granted and you're just always thinking about what you can't do. And I think you do compare yourself more and, I don't know, um, like you've got all these things that you're trying to, I don't know, achieve. Whereas now I'm not really trying to achieve anything other than just dance the best that I can. Which is, I suppose, what you're always trying to do. Like, I, I, that was that was all I ever really needed to do was to try and dance the best that I could. Um, and in terms of enjoying it, I've never had to try to enjoy it. I, I've just always absolutely loved it. Mm. Um, it's never been an effort. It's, it's not. It's not work in that sense. Like, I love it. I and I love everything about it. So, you know, when you were asking about, you know, Anton and what does he want to do? Well, you know, he says that you know, acting and singing, it, it's not work. So I think, well, give that a go and, and see see what happens. But mm. I think um, my main thing for him would be that he always maintains that that love for what he loves and that, you know, doing it and trying to do it seriously won't like basically kill that that enjoyment and passion. Because I still remember, you know, you know back when we were at school we used to do like um, work experience they don't really seem to do that the same way now. Like they have careers nights and everything, but they don't basically have a week where they go off and do whatever they want. But I still remember, like you remember my brother, how he loved computers back in the day when no one had computers. Like I remember he did work experience doing computers. I think he went to New South Wales Uni and was just attached to some computer unit. And I still remember he came back from that and he said, doing that has made me realise I don't want to work in computers he said, I love computers so much, I never want to do a job or do something that will kill my love of computers. And he said, like, looking at what they were doing, he said, I think that there's a risk that if I do this for my job, I wouldn't like computers anymore. And um, I think you know, that, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I mean, I, you know, my brother definitely ha- always had a gift for, I don't know, computers and that kind of thing. And he definitely still loves his computers, like, you know, playing computer games. And I know he, it's something that, you know, he's just always loved. Like, you know, when we used to watch Lost in Space, I think his favourite character was the robot. Do you know what I mean? Like, he, he had that. <laughs> like, and, you know, in Star Trek, like, he was a big sci-fi fan. Like, his favourite character was, you know, Spock. Like, he's he's got that kind of mentality, which is, I guess, kind of the opposite to me. Like, um, and, and I guess I've, yeah, I've always loved... Um, ballet and I mean probably the arts generally like I love I love reading and I love you know plays and theater and music like all these things I I really really love and now because I'm old I don't feel like I like obviously still try and get better but you don't feel like um well I guess you just feel as if it's enough to do it and, and try your best like, so that's the way I feel, say, with the cello. Like, I'm, I'm not good, but I, I just really love being in the orchestra and, you know, I, I play in a quartet. And, and again, I'm not good, but I, I really, really love it mm. and it's so enjoyable. So I feel like, um, you know, if I keep up with it, then by the time I'm really, really old, well, certainly with the cello, I might, I might be better. I think with ballet, <laughs> like you can't say, oh, the longer I go, I'll get better. Like at a certain point when you're like 70, 80, 90, I think there are some physical limitations there. But, I mean, I think I'll still enjoy it. And, um, I mean, as long as I can still dance, I, I, will, I will be dancing. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I, I took up the cello partly because I was thinking, oh, you know, what if one day I can't? dance what am I going to do um uh so yeah I suppose uh at these days I spend a lot more time doing ballet and dance so that I still do some tap as well but not, not as much as ballet um but you know I guess you know when I can't dance I suppose I'll have more time to play cello. Mm. Um, Cindy um then, just the the just going starting to wind this up um there's yeah. a question that I usually ask but I I mean I I feel I feel as though hearing about your career that uh, it's not going to be particularly appropriate, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So um, the question I ask is, has being a woman had any effect on your career? Um, Positive or negative? 
Um, I mean, it seems to me as though though nothing has had affected in your career. It's just you've you've just done, you've just followed exactly you know the interests, the things that happened. You say, "I'd love to do that." You follow the stage door. You followed. Yeah. I mean, my career there's been a lot of random things. Like I, I know that say a couple of decades ago, um, I was often getting asked, invited to you know Sydney Uni and New South Wales Uni. And to ask to speak to students, oh, you know, how do you become a media doctor? You know, how to become a doctor on TV? And I'd be like, well, I can tell you what happened to me, but it's not like I set out to do this, Like, but this is just what happened. I don't think there is a path to doing that. This is just what happened. Like apparently they needed someone. For whatever reason, a lot of people recommended me and I did it. And then, you know, someone saw this and said, oh, why don't you do this? And I, I, I just, I guess it's, it's more that I just said, Yes, and I gave things a go, um, but um, I'm sure. I mean, to be honest, I think for me, it's probably more has being Chinese <laughs> affected you. But that's a different <laughs> topic. I think, yeah, that definitely has affected me being being Chinese, being a woman. I, I think, yeah, obviously these have huge impacts. But um, but well, tell me about being Chinese. Tell me about being Chinese when in fact that is much. I mean, as you know, Cecilia, like back in back in the day, it was like you know, David in. Um, Little Britain, no, I'm the only gay in the village. Like back then, I was virtually the only Chinese in the village. Certainly in my primary school, I literally was the only Chinese female. My brother was the only Chinese male. We were the only Chinese people. This is, you know, back in the 70s. Like there just weren't that many Chinese people around. We were much rarer. And, well, I mean, to call a spade a spade, I mean, there was a lot of racism and there was a lot of, you know, teasing and, and bullying. Um, and even when it wasn't um, overt, I mean, there was definitely tacit um, bullying, you know, tacit racism and, um, you know, I mean, all kinds of things. I mean, so, yeah, I, I definitely think that obviously has had an effect on my life. But, um, I mean, I think that all I can say is that, you know, things have come such a long way where, you know, I'm just not, I'm, I, don't, I almost don't feel like, you know, Asians are a minority in the sense that there's a lot of Asians and I feel that, you know, obviously there is still racism just as there still is sexism, but I actually think things, you know, have improved a whole lot, not to say that they couldn't improve further, but um, from my perspective, like, things have improved a lot. Um, but, I mean, as you know, you know, when Pauline Hansen, um, you know, came around, like, like, that was kind of set back. I mean, you know, there was a lot more kind of bashing up of Asians. I mean, I think, you know, well, let's face it, I mean, it's, it's not saying anything new to say that racism is still there. I mean, clearly it is in, in all different forms and so is feminism. But, I mean, you've got to say, like, the lot, the, 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 what we have, the choices we have compared to, say, the choices my mother had, the choices her mother had, I guess I feel like, especially you know, having that perspective of, you know, my grandmother had her feet bound, you know. Like my grandmother, uh, her father um, was quite wealthy and had a private tutor come to the house to tutor her brothers and she wasn't allowed in the room. Mm. She would try and, like, listen in the wall, try and peek through the window, but she wasn't allowed to be educated because they said an educated woman is a lot harder to marry off. Mm. And they bound her feet. So that, you know, she could get a husband, um, cause you had to have small feet. Like, this is what we're talking about only two generations before us. So, do you know what I mean? And I remember like, <laughs> it's funny cause like, when I started doing a point, you know, like toe shoes with ballet, I remember my dad was like, Oh, this is very abnormal. And so he said, you know, like, you know, people, you Western people um, laugh at Chinese for the foot binding. He said, but look at you. <laughs> <laughs> It's very, very different. We do that out of choice and we can actually still walk. Mm -hmm. um, I think I also a point. Like it's very, very different. But but I guess like I I feel as if this is one of the great things about getting older is that you generally have like this perspective. This you you know, you've seen and heard so many things like firsthand, but also, you know, like you know people that lived in these times that people think of as archaic. Like people think foot binding, oh, that's the olden days. It's actually not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And even say my mother, 
she said that, um, you know, when she was a child, one time she was really sick and she had to go to the hospital this is in China. And she said she looked at the nurses and she thought they were like angels, you know, they were looking after her. And she said, oh, you know, that was when I thought, oh, when I grow up, I want to be a nurse. And I remember my mum said to me, you know, when I was a child, the idea that I would become a doctor, it just never occurred to me because women didn't become doctors. Mm. Like she said, I only thought I could be a nurse. She said, you know, but whereas, you know, obviously in my era, to be honest, it never occurred to me to become a nurse. <laughs> okay? Like it's, it's almost like the opposite. And I think it's partly in a school that we went to, um, right, we had so many options and our idea of what we could be and who we could be it was just so different from even just one generation before. Mm. And, um, I mean, there are just so many ways in which I feel like, you know, like in a relatively short number of years, women have come such a long way, but there's a long way to go. Like there's a long way to go. Um, mm. But I feel it's, there's, there's um, so much hope for the future and um, I think, you know, in, in another generation, like hopefully we live long enough to see it, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be marvelling again. Like even now the fact that I can talk to you and you're in Paris and I can actually see you on this little laptop, like, you know, when we were at school, like I would just be like crazy. The fact that you can have a magical book, MacBook, this is really just a magic book and you can, you can Google anything you like and see pictures, watch movies, like, like, there's just so much that is unimaginable and I just think, you know, that's been in in a matter of decades um, and then, you know, two generations ago, you know, my grandmother wasn't allowed to be educated and was having her foot, feet bound. Like in one generation, two generations ahead, what else will we see that will go, oh, my God, I can't believe that in your day. Like if, if you and I are lucky enough to have grandchildren, you know, one day that our grandchildren will be saying, oh, my God, Grandma, I can't believe, you know, Homer, I can't believe that, you know, that you had that outlook or that you experienced that. Like that is just so unimaginable, like seems crazy. Mm. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to seeing, you know, what the future holds that, you know, that we'll just be marvelling at because, there's just so much to marvel at within our lifetime. Yeah. And Cindy, um, I think that's probably a, a great place to um, start to bring this to an end. Um, I mean, what, what I am left with is that you have just followed your loves and what you're interested in and you haven't let anything stop you. And if something came up and you thought, well, that might be a good idea, well, you just did it. And um, I think <laughs> that um, i just like to reflect that back to you um and also what what, what <laughs> well but, but um, maybe that's for another chapter but yeah no certainly like there's been a lot of things that I've been really happy to have happen that um I couldn't have predicted definitely didn't plan and yeah I feel like I've been really really lucky in a lot of things and yeah there are a lot of things where I would say things turned out either better than I imagined or that basically I just couldn't have imagined. And, and the main main one there, I would say, is is my kids because I've often said to the kids, you know, if, if someone like, I don't know, God or someone had said to me, okay, you want two kids, tell me exactly what you want them to be like, tell me what, what, uh, what you want them to look like, what their personality, characteristics, qualities, I couldn't have, I couldn't have, made to order like, I couldn't have described what they are like they are so much more wonderful than anything I could have conceived or asked for do you know what I mean it's almost like like you know some people might make a wedding list and say oh, you know I want this Tupperware I want this you know like crockery or whatever but instead you just say well just give me whatever it is like I didn't I didn't have an idea of what I wanted my kids to be like other than alive. Like I literally just wanted them to be like resuscitatable, <laughs> like to be able to have a life. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely one thing where I just feel like I've been surprised 
beyond my wildest dreams. There's lots of things in life that I've been disappointed, but that's probably the biggest thing where I feel like I didn't have any particular expectations. Not that I had low expectations. I, I just, I just wanted, I wanted to have any kind of kids or even just one. And yeah, they're they're beyond my dreams. And in terms of my career, um, yeah, I didn't really have too many fixed ideas because, as I said, I didn't even know what it was to be a doctor. And I certainly didn't know that I would end up doing, you know, the other things like the TV and, you know, whatever other things that ended up happening. But I've kind of enjoyed it. And, um, yeah, um, I, I think that, yeah, probably the thing that I've loved the most in my life is the kind of enduring passion has actually been dancing. Well, as you know, like that that's what, I guess you remember is that that's what I really wanted to do. Mm. And I guess, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have known that I would still be dancing and loving it so much and how well I'm dancing sort of doesn't matter so much. It's like I I guess it'll, I'm just always dancing the best I can and mm. it's always enjoying it <laughs> without trying. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's just been a it's just been a pleasure to to speak to you and to hear about you know, your life. You, Celia. You look exactly it's other than the glasses and the headphones. You look exactly the same. Many <laughs> tail with a green ribbon in it. But other than that, you look the same, sound the same, you feel the same. Yeah, still that mm-hmm. sort of calmness and yeah, that brightness. That it's really fun. Thank you, Cindy. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Brave New Women. Certain podcast sites such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts or Podchaser let you leave a rating and a review. The more ratings and reviews we get, the more people will listen and the more these women's stories will be shared. So I'd really appreciate it if you could. Thanks for listening.